Hi there. So we're going to start the book of Matthew, his gospel. This is the last book in the Through the Bible series that I started at the beginning of the year. And aside from the rest of Revelation that I still have to cover from chapter you know, 7 on, this will complete the Through the Bible series in as close to chronological order as in the order they were written so you could get an idea of the history as it pro progressed. So that's, um, <clears throat> so we'll start this. Um, today, Matthew, as you know, Matthew was a tax collector and being very good at names and dates and genealogy. I mean, tax collectors had to keep, you know, pretty precise reports in the day. You know, he covers a lot of the genealogy in the first chapter, which we'll go over and that maybe as far as we get today, but we're going to start with Chuck Swindoll's overview, like always, and we'll jump over there. And we'll begin. <clears throat> Who wrote the book? While Matthew did not sign his, his own name to his gospel, the early church uniformly att attested to the apostles' authorship of the book. As early as A.D. 140, a Christian named Papias wrote that Matthew had compiled the sayings of the Lord in Hebrew, presumably before Matthew translated him into Greek for a larger audience. Matthew's name appears in all biblical lists of the twelve apostles, though Mark and Luke refer to him as Levi. His history as a tax collector distinguished him from other apostles, and immediately after his call to follow Jesus, an event he recorded in Matthew 9.9, 9, Matthew hosted a feast for Jesus in his home with an invitation list made up of Matthew's sinful friends. Apparently, Matthew did not think it odd that Jesus and he would associate with the sinful and downtrodden of society. Where are we? <clears throat> Matthew is the most Jewish-centric of the four Gospels. The Apostle regularly invoked the writings of the Old Testament prophets in an effort to illustrate Jesus' identity as Israel's long-awaited Messiah. However, the Gospel of Matthew has been notoriously difficult to date. Several factors speak of, to a date ranging from A.D. 60 to 65. First of all, the book makes no mention of the destruction of the temple, an event which occurred in A.D. 70. Such a cataclysmic event likely would have received some comment, particularly in a book so clearly influenced by Judaism. The largely Jewish character of the book also suggests it was written at a time when much of the evangelism by Christians was directed more exclusively at Jews, something that became less and less common as the decades passed. Finally, many scholars believe Mark to have been the first gospel composed, making it most probable that Matthew was written soon after. <clears throat> we just finished Mark. Why is Matthew so important? The Apostle Matthew, a Jew himself, offered a decidedly Jewish perspective on the ministry of Jesus. He included more than 50 direct citations and even more indirect allusions, allusions from the Old Testament. This exceeds any of the other Gospels and indicates that Matthew had the Jewish population in mind when he sat down to write. Matthew's extensive connections between Jesus and the Old Testament provide ample prophetic evidence for Jesus' ministry, but also gave contemporary readers a glimpse into how first century readers approached the Old Testament with a Christ-centered mindset. <clears throat> In addition, Matthew's Gospel answers the question on the mind of every Jewish reader. If Jesus is the King of the Jews, then where is God's promised kingdom? Matthew reveals that Jesus did offer the kingdom to Israel, but the offer was rejected <clears throat> in those verses. God's primary work in the world is now accomplished through the building of Christ's church, after which Jesus will come again to earth and establish his kingdom, ruling the world from Israel. What's the big idea? Matthew wrote his account of Jesus' ministry to show that Jesus was and is indeed the king, Israel's long-awaited Messiah. He reflected this concern in his opening line, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. From there, Matthew consistently took his readers back to the Old Testament, providing Old Testament testimony regarding the birth of Jesus. Bethlehem is the location of Jesus' birth, the flight to Egypt, Herod's slaughter of the infants, and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In a world where many of the Jewish community had claimed the role of Messiah for themselves, Matthew's commitment to grounding the life of Jesus in, in the Old Testament raised Jesus above the multitude of these false messiahs. 
the apostle painted the port, a portrait of our Lord that in that highlights his uniqueness among all others to ever walk this earth. I agree. How do we apply this? <clears throat> After enduring 400 years of prophetic silence, God's people must have wondered whether or not he had deserted them. After centuries of regular communication from God, the people found themselves without a genuine prophet or spokesman for God. However, the ministries of John and Jesus reminded God's people that he had not forgotten them. God's silence during that period was merely a precursor to pulling the linchpin of his redemptive plan. God hadn't forgotten. He remembered his people. Matthew made that clear. It was true then, and it is certainly true today. Do you ever feel as though God has deserted you, or that, or that he sits in silence in the face of your requests? As we read through the pages of Matthew, not only do we see Jesus Christ revealed as Israel's King and Messiah, but his coming to earth as God in the flesh reminds us of his deep love for us. Now resurrection, resurrected and ascended, the Lord Jesus will always be with us, even to the end of time. That's Matthew 28, 20. Christ's commission to his followers is still his mandate to us today. Make disciples of all the nations. Christ's work of building his church is the work he does through each of us. There you go. And that was Chuck Swindell's overview. I will, I will put the link to that down in the description. Now let's jump over to Matthew and we'll begin. Now I'm going to peruse some of these kind of quickly because it's a genealogy of the whole first <clears throat> the whole first chapter is a genealogy, and we'll just go through them quickly here. Matthew 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Sal Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. We know her. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. That's another story. Solomon was the father of Rehob. Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram. Jehoram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amon. Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers, born at the time of the exile to Babylon. Babylon. After the Babylonian exile, Jehoiachin was the father of, of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud. Abiud was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Eliud. Eliud, Eliud was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer was the father of Matan. Matan was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. <clears throat> okay, don't hold it against me if I said most of those names wrong, because I probably did. Okay. Okay. All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. And that's three sets of 14 generations. I'm not sure how long they considered a generation. You know, it's a total of 42 generations. Three sets, or six sets of seven. And I try to um, to compare that to <clears throat> Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 9, where he talks about, you know, basically 490 years, you know, seven sevens plus 62 sevens. And, when all this stuff would happen, but my brain got confused. So, okay. Let's start 18. The birth of Jesus the Messiah. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Joseph. 
to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet, which is, <clears throat> Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. And there you go. We're at 10 minutes. I think we can maybe cover chapter 2. It's a famous chapter. Christmas chapter. Okay. Visitors from the East. <clears throat> Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law, said, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. You're right, Matthew does use a lot of Old Testament. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time that the, fir the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. Right. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star that they had been in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now this right here, because it said they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, people always confuse in the Christmas stuff that there was three wise men since there was three gifts. It never says how many wise men there were. There might have been 20 of them. There may have been 10. There may have been two. But, you know, and it was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh were very expensive back then, and gold. I do know that they got enough gold. They had to flee to Egypt, and they got enough. They got enough gold and enough from this stuff to support them for eight to ten years. So, it was quite a gift. So, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Okay, the escape to Egypt. Here we go. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Wow. That night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Wow. That alone would get him <laughs> something in my book. Based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance, Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. Wow, I can't even imagine that. Man. I've always had trouble with that section because killing every child in a land under two is just... Man. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, 
he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said. He will be called the Nazarene. Okay, so that's so that's one and two. And that, you know, that covers his childhood. We'll go ahead and get into John the Baptist next time. Obviously, he, he jumps right through it. But there's a lot of good stuff in here that wasn't in the other Gospels. So, and we know from modern day, you know, the way a police investigator investigates a crime is he separates, separates the witnesses before they have a chance to talk to each other. So they can't compare notes and start stories and then they write then they get all the separate witness statements and from there they could put a story together <clears throat> the gospels don't contradict each other there are different points of view from different people and totally different kinds of people okay peter was a fisherman okay he knew nothing about tax collecting knew nothing about genealogy he didn't care about numbers and figures you know other than for his own bookkeeping Okay, Luke was a doctor. Okay, he knew doctoral stuff, very critical thinker. Okay, Matthew was a tax collector, good with numbers and figures and people and and records. Okay, and they all recollect different things, but it's one story, you know. And you can put all four gospels together and get the whole story, and they don't contradict each other. I mean, none of them say, "Oh, he was here." No, he was here. Yeah, so, but we'll get into Matthew 3 next time and we'll start with John the Baptist and we'll go through the whole thing a chapter at a time. This will probably take, you know, five or six sessions at least because there's Matthew's a, a, a pretty detailed book. But till next time, keep praying. Always ask the Holy Spirit for the words and he'll always give them to you. Okay, see you next time.